it's about you know looking at how do we build a new system how do we get out of the boxes we were in before and how do we create a system that is reflective and accessible to the community to the entire community and so definitely as we talk about that the issues of equity and diversity uh, need to be highlighted need to be discussed they are there front and center and we are really excited we have a dynamic panel uh, to to address this issue which is so critical to the whole uh, discussion on career development so it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator for this panel we're thrilled she's here alexandra oliver de villa who is the executive director of Sociedad latino latina and uh who's going to moderate that and i'm going to let alexandra introduce the panel but i want to thank you all for being here and i look forward to what you have to say uh, thank you so much uh, again. Uh, my name is Alexandra Oliver Davila. You just call me Alex. When I hear Alexandra, I always feel like I'm in trouble. Um, so I'm really excited to uh, be part of today um, and really excited to actually meet over Zoom um, the panelists for today. Um, having looked you up, you're very impressive. And I know we're going to get a lot of really great information. Um, so we have Orrin White, uh, who's the Director of College and Career Success. Uh, from United Way, Delaware. I just want to say I'm a huge United Way fan. I'm actually um, a, a, a person that donates to United Way, so I encourage everybody to do so. Um, <clears throat> and um, Janae McLaren, Engagement Manager, National Association for Partnerships and Equity, and Sharon Givens, President of National Career Development Association. So today, um, we are going to talk about diversity in a little bit of a different way. I know when uh, people hear the word uh, diversity and workplace diversity, sometimes they may cringe. Um, it's 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 a sensitive conversation, and usually, unfortunately, not uh, posed in a positive one. I'm here to say that that those days are over, um, and that really workplace diversity has to be the norm. So you're going to just have to get comfortable and that it is what it is. Um, it, it's, it's even beyond you know, that it's the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do, um, but it's a new paradigm. When we look at how the world has changed, how you know, the globe has changed, how our cities have changed demographically. And um, you know, we all know that diverse teams make for better teams and lead to more successful outcomes. And the more diversity on a team, the greater chance of having different perspectives and different lived experiences that people are bringing to the table. And the more diversity on a team, the greater the creativity and ability to problem solve. And then additional benefits include uh, increased productivity and profits. More than ever, employers are prioritizing diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives and investing resources into making sure that their teams are set up for success. And ultimately, this unit you know, results in high impact competitive organizations, institutions, uh, businesses with high levels of employee engagement. And according to a McKinsey report, gender diverse companies are 25% more likely to outperform their peers, while ethnically diverse businesses are 36% more likely to perform better than their competitors. And despite this documented evidence regarding the advantages of diverse workplaces, many organizations, institutions, businesses, employers all struggle to implement a successful diversity recruitment and also retention. So it's beyond recruitment, but also uh, retention. And so we're gonna talk about um, what can you do to improve your diversity recruitment and retention strategy. So as I said earlier, rather than focusing on why diversity and equity is important, um, because it is, and I, uh, if, if, if you're not in that place, um, I, I strongly encourage a lot of self-reflection and a lot of reading and happy to talk to anybody. Um, but like I said, uh, those days are over, we're there, it is important. Um, it only benefits our workplace. We're gonna chat with these three, um, individuals who are going to share their the positive impacts and successes that they are seeing because they are not just talking but also walking the talk so i'm going to ask um, each uh, panelist um, to introduce themselves briefly and just tell us about 
uh, their role in their organization. Um, and then uh, go right into the first question, which is um, in what positive ways has focusing on diversity and equity impacted the culture of your organization, your staff, your colleagues? Uh, what value is diversity bringing into your organization? Basically, you know, how are you generating buy-in around that? So I'm gonna start uh, with Sharon uh, Givitz. Again, she is the president of the National Career Development Association. Sharon. Yes. Thank uh, you for being on this, on this panel. So just a heartfelt thanks for having me um, as a part of this very important conversation. So I'm certainly excited to be here today. And I'm actually president-elect of the National Career Development Association. Um, my actual tenure as president will begin uh, October 1st. So I'm very excited about that. But the way our organization works, becoming as president-elect, elect, and then president-elect, and then president. So we have a really, really rich opportunity to begin our platform and initiatives. Um, that we have in place or to perform. So the National Career Development Association is actually the largest career development uh, association in the world. So we do have a pretty large global presence. Um, our focus, of course, is research, professional development, publications. We try to set standards actually for practitioners who are in this field. Also credentialing, but most important, uh, most importantly, I would say is advocacy. That's a major role of our association. Uh, the association is actually divided into four different constituency groups, and that would be counselor educators, of course, individuals who work in academia, who are teaching uh, counseling, but more importantly, career related uh, courses as well. And then we have our K through 12 constituency group, which are professionals who work in some capacity in high school, middle schools, K through 12. Um, and that's a group that I think is really important. And I just have to say in my state, we have professionals that work in every middle elementary and high school facilitating career development services. Uh, the next constituency group would be higher ed, which is our actual largest group. And these are professionals that work in primarily career centers or either doing academic advising um, on some level, but they're on college campuses. The last constituency group, which was the group that I was the trustee for prior to becoming president elect elect, is private practitioners, business and industry, and agencies. So this group is comprised of government, uh, individuals who are facilitating career development in federal or state government agencies, career counselors in private practice, coaches, and also human resources, folks that are working in human resources, um, could be doing recruitment, training, but facilitating career development um, at, at, at some level. Um, we have ongoing initiatives, I have to say, that I'm most proud of to implement uh, diversity and inclusion practices within the association. And I'm looking forward to talking more about that later. Um, someone said earlier in their other life, um, I was a counselor educator and I returned to back to practice. I actually am licensed to practice in three different states. I have a practice in South Carolina and North Carolina. And I actually um, facilitate career counseling, um, of course, psychotherapy and coaching uh, and career assessment and testing. My areas of expertise, I would actually, probably a few areas would be integrating career development and mental health, which I think is very, very um, important. Of course, diversity and inclusion and employee mental fitness. And a lot of that has come about just from people experiencing even racial trauma in the workplace and how do they navigate that 
and still remain productive employees. So again, I'm glad to be here and I look forward to contributing to the conversation. Uh, thank you so much, Sharon. I'm going to ask uh, Janae McLaren, again, Engagement Manager for National Association for Partnerships and Equity. Uh, if you could introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your role, um, your organization, and also again, back to the same question uh, for all the panelists. Um, if you could talk about um, the positive ways that focusing on diversity and equity has impacted the culture of your organization, your colleagues, um, staff, and what value is diversity bringing into your organization? How are you really generating that, that buy-in? And thank you for being with us today. No, thank you for having me. I really am happy to be here. I appreciate the invitation and opportunity to share in this amazing um, experience. So uh, the National Alliance for Partnership and Equity, uh, NAEP for short, we are a membership consortium and we consist of uh, state members, local and regional organizations, as well as individuals, um, all with one focus in mind, increasing access for our students, speaking around ec um, equity and workforce diversity. Um, our line of business focus mainly on professional development, research evaluation, um, advocacy is based in the area of public policy and providing technical assistance. And so my role in all of that is I do provide professional development. I oversee our partnerships, external partnerships more specifically. And then I am the point person for our national summit, which we just completed last month. And it was um, really exciting to see so many people who are ready to have the, the most important conversation around equity. Um, to your question, I think when we think about why equity is important, especially for organizations like NAEP, where it's in our name, <laughs> it would behoove us to make sure that um, it is what we live and breathe and not just the title that's on our name badges. But I think for us, it creates this idea of a holistic engagement. A lot of times when we are working in spaces, we tend to work in silos. We don't get to know the people that we work with, so we don't truly understand what value they bring to the table and to the conversation. And I think one thing that COVID and the whole work from home has taught us as we sit in our Zoom offices that we start to see our, our colleagues in a different light. We start to, to see when the kids interrupt the cat walk across the screen. Um, my mother, perfect example, just came in and asked me was I on camera and I couldn't turn my head to say, yes, I was on camera. Um, but we all present a professional us and we present a personal us and rarely do those worlds intersect. And so because we are working from home, because we are now in other people's living rooms, bedrooms, garages, wherever you are relegated to have your, your Zoom offices, we're starting to see people as people and not just commodities within an organization. So the value of that diversity and understanding the different cultural ramifications that people deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, but also how those various cultural pieces build who they are and how those pieces can contribute to the business models that you are creating, especially for us because we do so much training outside of NAEP. We're a really small organization and we were already virtual to begin with. And so we do have the luxury, um, and I call it a luxury to go out and meet other people who are wanting to learn more about equity. So we get to see people um, in the learning space. And so this is very exciting when people want to, to take equity to the next level, to want to have conversations around diversity, to want to move the needle beyond the surface diversity that we have seen so often. And so I do feel that the value add is just the humanness of diversity that it brings to the workplace, to the conversation. So that we can see each other as people and start to relate and pull back those many, many layers of the different aspects that make up our own individual cultures, it creates for a more dynamic um, working experience. So thank you again for allowing me to, to be in this space with you today. No, thank you so much. And um, I, I had my daughter in here, if you probably saw me trying to you know, so I, I get it. I had to rush and pick her up from school, I understand. But I think you make such a valid point. Um, I think so many people dislike Zoom, but I do think there are some silver linings from, you know, Zoom or Microsoft Teams, whatever you're using, which is um, that intimacy that um, has 
been created um, and uh, I think allowed for more learning. Um, and that is a, a, a great thing. Um, sounds like you all are, you and Sharon are doing some really exciting work. Um, and so I'd like to uh, introduce Oren White, uh, Director of College and Career Success, United Way, Delaware, um, and ask you the same uh, question, um, Oren, in what positive ways has focusing on diversity and equity impacted the culture of your organization, your uh, colleagues, your staff, and, and what value is diversity bringing into your organization and how are you creating buy-in? And thank you for being on this panel. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for the kind introduction. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here with you all today. Uh, first, let me begin with extending thanks and gratitude to Dr. Solberg, Janet Bray, Robin, Spencer Murray, and the entire planning team for their flawless execution of the National Career Development Virtual Conference. I really hope everyone is enjoying the learning and sharing that has taken place over these past few days. And to your point, Alex, I would be remiss if I did not call out and name the work that we all collectively have ahead of us, and that is focused on equity and also on access. Uh, to be blunt, at the United Way of Delaware, we believe far too many of our Black and Brown students and families live in poverty and simply exist in crisis on a daily basis. And this has been made more difficult, uh, excuse me, this has been made more difficult by the pandemic known as COVID-19. I am pleased to be joined by my colleagues on this panel in discussing the critical strategies and evidence-based best practices that will ultimately meet the needs of children from diverse and underserved backgrounds rounds across the country. To talk a little bit about who I am, my name is Dr. Warren White, and I serve as the Director of College and Career Success at the United Way of Delaware. I am a national or regional youth development expert, facilitator, and also a consultant. To talk a little bit about the work of United Way of Delaware, at its core, our mission is to maximize the community's resources to improve the quality of life. And our vision is advancing the common good by creating opportunities for all. Simply put, our why is that we believe that social change and outcomes matter. Again, we believe that too many children live in poverty and too many families exist in crisis. We are, excuse me, United Way of Delaware uniquely amplifies individual, corporate, and partner resources that drive social change through collective impact. This collective impact model dramatically changes the trajectory of our state and also our future. Uh, we believe that this can be accomplished through a holistic approach through a community continuum strategy, focusing on communities of greatest need, which we identify throughout our state as our promise communities. It represents eight areas throughout the state of Delaware and 17 zip codes. From a database perspective, there's a little over 900,000 Delawareans that call a uh, Delaware home and over 300,000 Delawareans call one of these promised communities home. And these have been earmarked as the areas of highest need that are most impoverished or have lacked to those resources. Our home program areas are consistent around closing student opportunity gaps, college and career success, financial stability and empowerment. And we are driving this through investments, programs and programs and advocacy that is aligned through diverse partnerships. Now to focus a bit on your question, Alex, we believe that equity is not the same as equality. We are really focused on making sure that all students and an emphasis on all have equal access to a high quality education is indeed the goal. But the truth remains that some students need more assistance to access that education. Given students who come to school lagging academically because of factors outside of that school's control, the exact same resources as that students who are on target will not close the achievement gap. School districts will need to be ready to provide these vulnerable students more than other students and bravely defend those choices to do so. Essentially, when we focus on our work, United Way of Delaware is not a direct service organization. So as I sit before you today, I am really representing the incredible work of over 200 plus community-based organizations who are working on the front line to ensure the success of our young people. And the critical questions that we're asking is how do we connect and interconnect? Not an us and a them, but truly a desire to break down silos in favor of partnerships that truly benefit the outcomes of all youth. We all have important qualities that support positive youth development and build youth success. And the question that we've been consistently asking ourselves is, how do we bring those pieces together? 
Thank you so much. And you did such a great interaction introduction, which I should have done. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> that was really great. I was looking for my headphones and um, I, I, I was a little bit lost. So thank you. Um, and apologies that I didn't call you doctor. You earned that. That's a oh, big it's not deal. A problem, Alex. So no, no, it's a big, big deal. Um, and and it leads to what you were talking about that uh, unfortunately, when we look across sectors, when we look in education, healthcare, philanthropy, we do not see uh, diversity in the boardrooms. We do not see diversity in management. And uh, you know, you are an unfortunate uh, walking statistic of being a doctor. Myself, you know, having a master's. Um, hopefully, we'll have my doctorate in a few years. Um, but these, you know, these are like realities. And I think you said so well um, when you talked about COVID. Um, and I think. Uh, for many people of color, it was not a surprise we, when we saw um, the disparities um, that COVID highlighted. Um, and we, we knew that they were already there. And when we look at, you know, who was hit hardest, we look at employment rates, we look at, you know, deaths, um, illness, and we look at, you know, um, uh, loss of, of employment or employment hours, um, the digital divide, et cetera. And, and we know that, um, that we have larger, broader issues, which I think is what, you know, what this conversation, why it's even more urgent um, that we really think about um, how, how we create, you know, diverse uh, workplaces, how we create um, those pathways for young people as you were talking about. Um, and so my next question, um, I'm gonna go back to, to Sharon um, to, to ask about, um, and the work that you do, it seems like you are working in a lot of different spaces, um, but across those spaces that you're working in, um, can you talk a little bit about what are uh, some big takeaways or learnings from focusing on a diversity and equity? Um, and what are your diversity and inclusion best practices? And if you could share some success stories. So I think oftentimes, you know, um, Unfortunately, it's looked at like an HR thing, very, very shallow. So if you could talk a little bit from your perspective of working, sure. as you described, um, uh, what are those best practices? And if you could share some success. Sure. So kind of just picking up maybe from the first question, when I think about it in, in context of the association, just embracing diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think that's really powerful for our brand identity, um, for us to be um, seen as an association, an organization that embraces. And not only just looking at diversity, I think one of the mistakes that are made is looking at diversity, looking at equity, looking at inclusion, and looking at those separately versus integrating all three. Because even if you have a diverse staff or a diverse group, but inclusion is not involved or the equity piece is not involved, then there's still an issue. So I think what's really critical is looking at how do we integrate, embrace all three. And when I think about just one example with the association, we have a one of our strongest committees, I would say, is the diversity and inclusion uh, committee within our association. And they work um, primarily to create, of course, um, it's, a it's a dedicated group, group to create pathways for number one, engagement, because we look at the numbers, we have diverse people within the association, but are they engaged? Do they feel like they have the permission to serve? And that's very powerful. I'm here at the table, but do I have the permission to contribute? Do I feel welcome to contribute my skills or talents within this space? And I think that's very um, powerful. One of the other things that we did and really the response was, amazing because we did a survey, we reviewed our membership, and we looked at the person that wasn't at the table, the person that 
wasn't a member of the association? How many black male counselors did we have? So we offered, which was one of the things through the diversity and inclusion committee, um, a breakfast and invited these people. It was their responsibility to go and recruit and say, we have you here, what do you need? How do we get you involved? We know how many students of colors, how many clients of colors that, uh, that actually need assistance, but we don't have you at the table. So that was one of the major efforts that we did. The other thing that we're doing that should be ready and available next year is we're now updating our career development competencies for counselors, which is very critical. It's important for folks in this field to have standards. And we feel like as a part of the association, it's our obligation to prepare our providers and practitioners to actually be equipped to work with diverse groups. Thank you so much, Sharon. I think um, you make such a great point. Um, I can't underscore enough, which is as a person of color leading an organization, um, whether you are an organization that is led by a person of color or an organization that is all, you know, people of color, I think it's still a conversation, right? It's still a journey. Um, and you can't take for granted that just because you have people of color uh, sitting around the table, you know, there's, it, it is so important to be inclusive um, and to really look at it as a journey. And I think so true, like who is missing, you know, at the table um, and then all of the different things that come, even I think of myself, like in my organization, uh, we, we focus working with Latino youth and, um, you know, when people think of Latinos, they think, oh, it's just one, one culture and it's, it's really not. Um, and there's a lot of nuances, uh, a lot of different stereotypes. Um, and so making sure to have the space to have those uh, conversations, so true. Thank you um, so much for sharing that. And I'm gonna now turn to um, Janae and, and, and same question, um, if you could talk about the big um, takeaways uh, or learnings from focusing on diversity and equity. And um, if you could talk about some of the best practices um, and share a few success stories with us? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that I think about a lot is when we started thinking about COVID and the racial disparities happened this past year that we all watched um, and our focus was because we were all at home and I often think if we had been in our normal workspaces, would we have paid that much attention to it? Um, and so because we were in essence homebound, um, we had to really take stock in what was going on. We can no longer pass the buck and say, that's not happening in my neck of the woods. That's not happening um, in the spaces that I work and breathe. But in doing that, um, we have to be careful to not regulate diversity, equity, inclusion, access to one person or to one department. The equity officer can't be your equity plan. The diversity council can't be your equity plan. It has to start top down. There has to be tremendous buy-in from leadership. Um, and I think what we've seen in organizations we work with, but also what we've seen at, at NAEP, because a lot of times people think, oh, because you, you have it in your title and you do it, that you don't ever slip, but we slip. Um, and so when, specifically when um, the Black Lives Matters was happening and the statement was being drafted, a lot of heated conversations happened because people were speaking from lived experiences. And at that point, it was clear to us that we hadn't done our own work in some ways, that we were so busy doing the work for others that we hadn't taken the time to do some self inventory. You know, Because again, we regulated those conversations to, to certain people in the organization. And so one takeaway for me is that you have to look at equity as a as a plan that includes everybody and not just the one person. And typically that one person is a person of color. And so that in some ways tokenizes them, but it also puts a lot of pressure on that person to, to, to be the end all be all for everybody in the organization. That can't be the person who you put out front when it's time to make the statement. That can't be the person that you go to to say, okay, this is a problem, how do we do that? Or when you have a training, make sure you have 
one person of color who can speak to that audience. It's really important that it's a cross collaboration across all departments and that it's everybody's responsibility. Um, and in doing that, one of the other things that we focused on as we were doing trainings was people would come to the trainings, they would come to the technical assistance and be really excited. And then we would follow back up and just to check and see how things were going and nothing had happened. And what we saw was leadership, the policymakers, the folks who write the checks were not at the table. Um, they were sitting representatives because that made them look as if they were doing the work. And by no means is that a dig to anyone. It's just simply what we figured out was that you have to engage the decision makers if you want to get it done. It does me no good at all to train your staff if upper management administration is not going to be a part of that conversation because the staff can only do so much. So we created um, an equity leadership institute and really encouraged leaders to come so they could sit and soak what we were saying. Um, and then we made it where it wasn't a magic bullet or here's here's what you have to do. If you go back and do these five things and you'll be equitable and everyone will be great. Like it really was about doing the work. And so that was one thing that we really focused on and seeing the success and the response of having um, people sign up for that leadership institute. And then the other piece um, that was near and dear to me, I've been doing a lot of work in the spaces of apprenticeship and workforce and working with youth. And one of the things that we've been focused a lot on is the importance of youth voice. I always find it a tremendous disservice that we're gonna serve a community, but we don't invite that community to the table to Sharon's point. You know, we say, come and join us, but we never mic them up. We never say, what do you think? So we tell them what they think. We tell them what they need. And then we're surprised when it doesn't work. So we invited um, a leadership group this summer um, and we required that they had a member of the youth community, a student had to be a part of the leadership group. And we also paid that student because that was the other piece of it, that a lot of times when students are involved, we want to use their experience and their expertise, but we don't compensate them properly. And so it was really important for us that we gave students a voice, that we made them feel a part of this opportunity. and. The, re the return on investment was huge. They spoke at our conference. It was one of the most attended sessions. It was very raw and real to hear a student tell a bunch of administrators, what you're doing does not work for me. And if you want me to be successful, then you need to hear me. So I think giving voice and speaking truth to power was really vital um, for us and the learning experience. Um, and we've continued to see the benefits from that piece. Such great points. You are speaking my language. Uh, I work with young people, so I could not agree more. I think uh, whether it's young people or families, um, if you are doing the work and uh, you're saying that you're representing policies cannot be made, programs cannot be made without those they are trying to represent um, to be part of the conversation. Um, in my own organization, uh, similarly, uh, we have a, a pipeline uh, and we have alumni who stay with us until some of them are even like 28, 30 years old, they're still with us. It's, it's really wonderful, but being able to um, think about that as like a pipeline for our um, diversity. And you made another, I think, really wonderful point, which is, um, I think, one, one, this is my own pet peeve and may not be everybody's, but I think when you start looking at um, having a committee that's dedicated to you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, I always find that really problematic because I think it's everybody's responsibility. It's similar to um, the notion that you have staff in a school that is like a family engagement person and then they're looked at as having the complete responsibility of getting families engaged when really it should be the custodian, the receptionist, the teacher, the principal, the lunch monitor, the bus monitor. So thank you for making those points. Um, and I'm going to move to Warren now um, and ask you the same question, Warren, uh, if you could talk about uh, big takeaways or learnings from focusing on diversity and equity um, and some best practices, best practices and success stories. And I think, you know, you have your United Way hat and then you're also working with other organizations. So whichever you feel comfortable talking about either or, or both uh, up to you. Absolutely, Alex. 
And um, I think I'm going to dovetail uh, with my colleagues um, who really talked about the role of community based organizations, but also kind of under the umbrella of COVID-19, which has really been a focus for all of us. Um, but specifically to speak to the members, employers of industry, we know that community based organizations provide the best insights into the on the ground needs and as well as the cultural context for clients from diverse backgrounds, leveraging their idiosyncratic trust from a long history of engagement in that community. And I think the questions that we've really asked ourselves in terms of how they advance equity is what can community-based organizations do in this space and what's being done well in this space? Um, chief amongst them is providing that additional capacity to state leaders in districts for which to support more students in expanding their career and their life goals, as well as supporting the development of critical employability skills to be successful learners and successfully matriculate into the post-secondary into the workforce. I think if I was to frame this thought is that community-based organizations cannot just be a part or a thought, but they must be integrated in a thoughtfully embedded part of the solution. Across the country, we're seeing state plans for accelerating student learning, including a range of new strategies and targeted interventions. We know that states are developing multi-tier systems of support, and they are now examining potential partnerships to address not only academic needs, but also social and emotional needs and competencies, which includes efforts to intentionally provide more learning during and after school. Simply put, employers today are looking for what they call deep human skills in the future of their workforce, but we recognize these skills as advanced social and emotional learning skills. It's about helping youth to make those important linkages between those developed skills and their talents and helping these same young people, black and brown and Latinx, identify how that skill or that talent aligns to the future world of work. Um, Alex, I would be remiss if I didn't think about uh, reflecting to my attendance of a Brown paperback session a few weeks ago, um, in which I had the opportunity to learn about the phenomenal work that Sociodad Latina is doing and their after school program and their summer program in Boston to help you really develop those skills that they need to successfully enter key high demand and high wage jobs. Um, sharing those best practices, hearing those terms, such as ensuring those young people were confident that they were competent that they were proud of their culture and really focusing on education, workforce development, civic engagement, arts and culture, but most in chief of importance, Dr. Solberg, thanking you for the invitation, is partnering with Boston University to integrate the critical STEAM curriculum and programming being funded through the National Science Foundation. So I will certainly allow you to speak more to that. Um, but for me, um, in terms of talking about best practices for us, uh, we know that COVID-19 has changed everything. And we know this full well. However, for many Delawareans who were living week to week before COVID, the cascading impact on their finances, their health, and on the education of their children has been nothing short of catastrophic. A report published by McKinsey and Company laid out the implication of education opportunity gaps with a specific focus on children of color and those who come from impoverished or underrepresented areas who forecast to be impacted most. From a data perspective, the McKinsey and Company report forecasted that all children, regardless of their race, their color, or their creed, uh, will be suffering from a minimum of six months of learning loss. But when we disaggregate that data and we begin to look at race and socioeconomics, we know that for black and brown students, that number jumps from six months to nine months of average learning loss. But when we look at simply low income children, that number jumped to a full calendar year of average learning loss due to the pandemic known as COVID-19. But to talk about some of those best practices, I encourage everyone that there is hope. In the middle of this pandemic, in partnership with 21 com based community based organizations, the Longwood Foundation, the City of Wilmington, numerous corporate and individual donors, and most of Delaware schools districts from Brandywine School District in the north to Seifer School District in the south, United Way of Delaware acted with urgency to raise $1 million to establish or maintain 26 COVID learning pods in some of Delaware's most underrepresented communities. These professionally staffed, 
safety compliant learning pods now help, excuse me, now help keep more than 700 Delaware students from falling further into the academic achievement gap. But to bring up those concepts of equities for those that are familiar with learning pods, we know that a lot of this had to do with income and finances. Though from those from more affluent communities had the resources for which to bring in a singular teacher and pull together pods of young individuals as districts began to go from a hybrid to a virtual format. But again, for Black and Latinx students and students that come from more impoverished communities, that simply wasn't the case. United Way of Delaware was proud to stand with our community-based organizations to close that gap. In the COVID context, a learning pod is simply a small group of students who study together in person in a safe, supervised location outside of the classroom. But these learning pods offer so much more. They offer computer and internet access, academic coaching, homework and study assistance, nutritional meals, and most of all, for our young people, this was a safe and supervised place for children to remain focused on their school. Also critical to the success of this reimagined approach to education has been United Way establishing the Learning Pod Community of Practice, which features those same 20 community-based organizations that are now standing up over 26 Learning Pod statewide. And the goal for the community of practice was to meet weekly to share what those best practices would look like and also to help our children and their families meet the challenges of virtual learning during a global pandemic. And to talk a little bit about the data has been absolutely encouraging. Across the Learning Pod Collaborative, we've seen 86% across the collaborative of young people attending their Learning Pod. 83% of our young people are successfully turning in their assignments. And then 94% of all of these young people were successfully participating in social and emotional learning outcomes. From an academic performance perspective, we saw 61 of those 719 students make honor roll and over 100 students in grade K through 12 have made significant academic improvement, which means they came to the pod in danger of failing and now they are successfully passing all of those classes. Also, what I would like to call out is the importance of equity and diversity as it relates to staff and administration that some of my colleagues has always talked about. We know that the ratios that sometimes take place in school often ostracize our black and brown young people. Within these pods, we were able to have an average of one teacher to seven students. 57% of the learning pod staff reside in the communities that they serve. And we know how it is important for our young people to see the individuals that are providing their instruction that look like them, that sound like them, that can assist them in that regard. And 40% of the administrators resided in the communities that they serve. So simply put, this has been a good investment in advancing equity and is also advancing diversity because there's a groundwork for success that is in place. There's an infrastructure and a coordinated inter-organizational platform that is constantly improving performance week over week for our most impoverished young people. We have a network of school districts, community organizations, and supporters that are both strong and active. And finally, the community of practice has the metrics and standards that ensure the fidelity to the curriculum that is being offered by their school district. Warren, I think you're my new favorite person. Um, thank you for coming to the uh, Sociedad Latina uh, conversation, brown, brown bag lunch. And thank you, Scott, for facilitating that. But um, are you a new dad? Was that you? That is me. Congratulations again. Thank you, um, thank you for being part of that. Um, I think you just said so many important things. Um, I, I think um, as we saw, uh, as we have seen during COVID and, and hopefully will continue, I think um, the support of community-based organizations that have the cultural and linguistic um, expertise and trust of the community is so important. Um, this work cannot be done without those organizations. Um, I know in my own organization, uh, we were able to retain 100% of students from last year through this year, through COVID, uh, through the virtual uh, uh, world, um, providing uh, engagement, enrichment um, opportunities, academic um, supports. We're able to provide uh, cash assistance. Um, we were able to translate for families with teachers um, to be able to get food, to be able to help people navigate when they could collect unemployment or some of the special opportunities that came out around like rental relief. Um, and I say that because it's really important um, that we value 
those community-based organizations because they already have that trust and because they are multilingual, multicultural, um, and the nonprofit sector has been hit very hard with COVID. And unfortunately, there's so much research around that there's just not enough organizations that are led by people of color or that the management are uh, people of color and they don't get the same type of funding um, because they're, you know, there's a lot of bias, et cetera. Um, and, you know, I think in Boston, I, I think about the work that I'm doing that is beyond the purview of the organization. Like we are doing vaccine clinics, you know, like who knew that we'd be signing people up or like being, you know, on the ground, um, getting people education and let, having them be less scared and helping them to get to those places and get those uh, appointments. Um, and if there had been more of us, then I think we'd be in a different place. Like as an example, there are more Sociedad Latinas out there. We'd be in a different place in terms of like vaccination as an example. So I think it's it's just so important. Um, and what you said too around um, uh, the reflection, I think many times we hear like there's there's not staff that have uh, the experience, um, you know, that we can't find people to hire. And I think we are, I think Janae also pointed that out. It's like our youth are sitting right here um, and we should be building those pipelines within our school. And we look, when we look at K-12, when we look at higher education, it's so important that our students actually um, have people that look like them teaching them. Um, and that doesn't mean that, you know, that, that we're, we're not welcoming white teachers. That's not what I'm saying. But um, there is just a lot of body of research around students who, you know, are able to see their, their professor, their teacher. Uh, and we have already, and that's just in the education uh, world. But in so many places, we could be uh, creating this pipeline. And I know we're, we're running out of time. So I'm going to throw this question out instead of going one by one. And just ask um, any of you that feel comfortable answering, because I also want to see if there's any questions that the um, um, that anybody has, and you could throw it in the chat. Um, my question um, at, for any of you um, is, in terms of advice that you have for other organizations around how can they track their progress to know that they're headed in the right direction, and then how can they engage? their employees and most especially underrepresented um, populations to gain insight into their sense of belonging and value. So I ask that because we've been so focused on, you know, like the importance of creating that, um, but then you have that. So, so how you create like that sense of belonging um, and how do you know you're headed in the right direction and any, and how would you, any advice you have for tracking that progress? So open up to either Sharon, Oren, or Janae, if you'd like to answer. If, you, if you're okay, Janae, I'd, I'd like to speak to that. When I think about a holistic approach, and it sounds really simple, but not being afraid to have a conversation. I think that's where it begins. Just being willing and open to have a clear conversation. And when I reflect on my own life, I don't think anybody's ever come to me or offered just to have a conversation. How do you feel? What do you need um, throughout this process? And when I think about associations or organizations, I like to talk about the three Ps of that, and that's people, profit, and productivity. So who's at the table? Who are the people there? And when we think about profit, not necessarily revenue, but what are you gaining? Look at what you can gain from all the diverse talents and people that you can actually bring uh, to the table, which in turn, I think it will increase your productivity. If people feel included, accepted, that they have a voice, I think that your productivity would certainly increase. And then to look at just some specific strategies that you could implement, certainly training, um, even as, um, as a part of my platform, I'm going to implement training for our leaders, for myself, for the board of directors. I think it starts with, with the top and we expand that to our constituents to make sure that they can have 
and have questions answered in terms of the service delivery process for the diverse groups that they are working with. Mentorship, mentorship is key. I think it keeps people engaged. It says you're, you're wanted, I'm willing to invest in you. And I think that sustainability will be more likely with that. Um, also having these soft opportunities to embrace difference. It could be lunch and learn, um, having a podcast, interviewing, I think would be important. And monitoring our language. Is your language inclusive? What terms are you using? Are your terms outdated? I think that's important to visit. But if I had to narrow it to one thing, it would be asking individuals, what do you need? to feel comfortable, a simple question. What do you need? Because ultimately I think our goal should be to ensure that all parties connected to our organizations, our associations have a clear avenue to engage and more importantly, they have an optimal experience. What is their experience like? Do we ask individuals that? What has your experience been like? What do you need from us? You said a mouthful there. I would totally agree on the courageous point. Please go ahead, Janae. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was going to actually segue from what Sharon said around the point of courageous conversations. I think that um, is definitely necessary. But one of the things that we talked about, too, is encouraging people to do the work. I think sometimes when we get in these spaces of equity, it's so easy to say, well, I don't feel that way or that doesn't affect me or I don't, I don't know because I'm not a person of color so I can't speak to that. Um, so I encourage people to do the homework, read, pick up an article, um, like really get involved in the conversation, but also have that really gut check conversation with yourself to say, how am I showing up in this space? And when I show up in that way, how does that reflect um, against the team that I'm a part of. But also you have to, from a leadership perspective, organizational perspective, you have to make dedicated time. Equity should never be put on your agenda as an item. If you wanna have a conversation about equity, it should be a dedicated space that people cannot opt out of. Um, everyone needs to be present and everyone needs to be able to participate at a level that's comfortable for them. Um, and then finally, I think for me, this idea of when people say, oh, we need to have more of this or more of that in a space, people instantly go to a deficit mindset. And so I challenge people to go into this place of an asset mindset. It's like when you're working with students, if you tell them, oh, this is going to be so hard, this is going to be so difficult, you have to do all this work, they're going to show up already feeling deflated. So when you're saying you want to have more women, more, more people of color, more people with disabilities, more people of whatever cultural piece you're missing, you can't approach it from this negative thing of what am I losing? What am I giving up? Um, when I was a law enforcement officer, I know it was like, oh, we can't say those jokes around her because she's a female and she's going to change the dynamic of the space um, versus saying she could bring something different into the space that we have. So we have to think of equity, not as something that we do, but a mindset that we all have to embody if we want to move the needle forward. So true. Last words, Oren? Yeah, absolutely. First, uh, Sharon and Janae, just an absolute pleasure to be on this panel with you guys. You guys are absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for creating this space for me. Um, I think I would uh, lean on one of my heroes in the SEL space. Her name is Dina Simmons, and she always uh, articulates that good intentions don't equal outcomes. And I think that's a, a very way of, of framing this. Um, and when we think about the concepts of moving into diversity and equity, I believe for industry, it's important to your point, Alex, to build both their cultural and their linguistic competencies. And this can be achieved through workshop as well as professional development so that they are ready to engage with those youth at that time frame. Uh, Dr. Soberg, I hope you don't mind. Uh, there's an important quote from your book, Making School Relevant with uh, Individual Learning Plans, and you, you said it so well, and I think
and this will be my final comment. She said, no matter how much we as educators, community-based organizations, or even family encourage the exploration of careers, there is no greater influence than when an employer looks directly at a young person and states in no uncertain terms that they belong or that they have a future in that industry. Um, I, I don't think it could be any articulated any better than that um, because it's absolutely the truth. It's creating those pathways and those bridges, as Jan said, between our employers and between our young people so that they can see themselves in those positions and employers gaining the benefit from the provision of expanding opportunities, but also those creating those pathways for youth, um, promoting diversity and inclusion that positively impacts their overall work environments. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all this afternoon. Thank you so much. Um, and I have to say um, that your, uh, I can give a great example, which is uh, when we had our end of year um, online celebration, Scott was there and one of our young people um, is looking for a job and Scott just typed in, hey, I can connect you. And it's so simple, but you know, it's like creating these spaces where we're like all connected and we're connecting young people. Um, and so my last words that I'll just say, thank you so much to Sharon, Oren, uh, Janae, uh, and thank you so much for letting me um, also facilitate this um, session. Um, last words, you heard all the suggestions um, and in the chat too, is this is a serious subject, but also let's not take it so serious. Um, and not. And for us, I think uh, Sharon talked about courage. So we have to have courage to ask questions. I think we're unfortunately living in a time where anything you say, you feel nervous. Um, I think we all have to be open that this is a learning journey together and it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to ask about people's culture, you know, obviously respectfully, but I think we have to have the courage and have the courage in your own workplace. When you see that your team is not diverse and inclusive to say that, to say, hey, you know, like who is missing here and who do we need to bring? So I will leave it at that. Um, I think we have uh, two more minutes. So if there's any burning question on the side that I may have missed, um, um, so thank you, everybody. Uh, I, I'll end two minutes early. Is that okay? Or you want me to just keep talking? <laughs> Alex, that's up to you. <laughs> I think that the conversation this panel has, has had has been so interesting and insightful and has really uh, made, you know, makes everybody stop and think. And I, to your to your point, it isn't just one way or the other. It, it can be, it can be, um, you know, scary, but it's it's also you know very enlightening, and I think it gives us all uh, something to shine for and to move forward on. And so I thought that all of your comments, your insights, the experiences you shared, have been really, really uh, it, great, and we thank you for that. Uh, Sharon, Janae, Orrin, Alex, a phenomenal panel, um, and I know that the whole area of uh, equity and diversity has been discussed by the uh, coalition board and uh, really looked at, you know, how do we practice what we preach as well? And that's, that's sometimes the hardest thing, you know, we can all say it, we, we know it, but doing it are two different things. So I think this gave a lot to talk, to think about. So I appreciate you all being here and sharing and, and, and making us all feel a little uncomfortable sometimes. And I think that's good. I think that's how we change is, uh, is to feel uncomfortable. So I thank you all uh, for being part of this.